Well, welcome. Um, so happy to be here. I usually come here for lectures, and so it's nice to be up on the podium. My name is Marie Carter, and I'm a writer and a tour guide with Burroughs of the Dead, as Ariel was saying. And um, I'm really excited to be talking about this topic. We've just developed a couple of new tours in association with this. Um, and I'm really fascinated by the figures that come up in this particular lecture. So I want to talk a little bit, first of all, about the term witches and how it has changed over the years. Um, because it's, um, it's a, an incredibly loaded word and it's also a kind of shape-shifting word, like the witches themselves. If I could distill what a witch means in a nutshell, I would say that a witch is a woman, or any one woman defined, who is doing something that disrupts the patriarchy in some shape or form. Um, often the woman wants, or is already in, a position of economic, social, or political power, and therefore needs to be taken down. And often the identity of witch is something that is forced upon people. So, um, one little tidbit before I really get into the witches of New York. I discovered a couple of years ago, like a lot of the imagery that's associated with witches comes from uh, women who were brewers for many, many centuries. So, going back to 7000 BCE, um, until the commercialization of brewing during the industrialization, women were the primary brewers on all in inhabited continents. And over a period of time, uh, throughout the 16th and 17th century, brewing in Europe changed from being a woman's profession to being one dominated by men, although women were still somewhat involved in the sale of beer. Um, and it's kind of interesting to think about some of the imagery connected with these alewives because many of the alewives would advertise what they were doing by putting broomsticks outside their house. That's how you know who the brewers were. They also wore these pointy large hats so they could stand out in public places and be noticed and people would be like, ah, that's where I go to get my ale. They also brewed in cauldrons, some large mats. <laughs> yeah. And, of course, they always had cats with them because the cats would keep the mice and rats and other vermin away from the grain. So it's kind of interesting to see how this imagery developed over the years. But, um, Coming back to witches in New York, now, in my experience as a tour guide, as far as I was aware, aware, there had only been one witch trial in New York City, which took place in 1665. And this is at a time where it's becoming New York, and it was originally a Dutch colony, as a lot of you know. Um, and even though the British had made uh, New York their own, there were still a lot of Dutch people living here who were making the laws and, um, and uh, generally making decisions and juries and so forth. So in 1665, Ralph and Mary Hall of Setucket, Long Island, were tried for the detestable and wicked act of witchcraft. And it's said that they had poisoned their neighbor, a man called George Wood, and the infant daughter of a woman called Anne Rogers. They showed up at the Stadthuis for the trial, and at the time it was inadmissible, uh, spectral evidence was inadmissible in the, um, in the uh, Stadthuis. So there was a jury who made the decision about this, and it was basically a very boring procedure. They were just like, this is, you know, we don't believe in this. Um, the, um, they were, um, the man was allowed off, but the woman had to come back three times to court to prove she was behaving herself, which she did, and then uh, nothing else came of it. So that's the end, as far as I was aware. And then every, um, every year around Halloween, because I'm interested in macabre, strange, and ghostly histories in my work, I always have like a pile of books by my bedside, uh, various things about ghouls and ghosts and witches. And one of the books I have picked up 
was a book by Susan Fair called American Witches. And I just assumed, knowing this history about the witch trial, that everything in there was going to be about New England. But then I came across this cur curious chapter called Witches of New York. And I was like, what? <laughs> what? This is so exciting. And I immediately had to find out what was going on here. So it turns out that in 1858, a man called Q.K. Philander Dosticks, and in case you're wondering <laughs> what on earth that stands for, stands for Queer Critter Philander Dosticks Perfect Brick. Um, and he had published this book in 1858 by a publisher called Rudd and Carlton on 300 Broadway. And the premise of this book was that uh, Mr. Dostix was going to visit all these fortune tellers on the Lower East Side and in Williamsburg in Brooklyn, uh, back when Williamsburg had an H on the end. And he was going to expose their devious ways. His premise was two part. First of all, he wanted to um, stop women from going to see these fortune tellers who he said were dangerous, they were soothsayers, they were quacks, you were wasting your money on them. And the second part was he wanted to stop other women going into this profession because, and he never quite makes this link clear, um, women who go into fortune telling are just one stop away from prostitution. <laughs> and there are lots of uh, parts of the book where he accuses the person that he's about to see of prostitution, even though like he's based on zero evidence. So a little bit of context for this talk. So this is 1858. This is around the time that spiritualism is getting going in New York City. As a lot of you probably already know, in 1848 in Hydesville, New York, uh, the Fox sisters uh, heard this rapping. And they linked it to someone communicating with, with them from the dead, someone they called Mr. Splitfoot. They said he was a peddler and he was murdered. His body was buried in the basement of their home. And this created quite the sensation at the time. The Fox sisters ended up going on tour. They showed up in spiritualist circles and they, um, they claimed they had the ability to speak with the dead. And spiritualism, of course, is like a new religion that gave women power because uh, they were said to be able to communicate with the dead and because women were considered to be passive figures, they were considered to be the best people to kind of um, channel the dead through. Um, in downtown New York, um, around 1856, a woman called Emma Hardin Britton comes to New York and she goes, um, she's a, a, a concert pianist, she's trying to support her family, and she's going on tour, she's from the UK, and she ends up going to see this woman called Miss Ada Hoyt on Canal Street, and there she has her first spiritualist experience and claims that she was able to communicate with the dead and Miss Ada Hoyt's. Then she goes to a place on 553 Broadway, which is kind of around today's Prince and Spring, um, it was called the Society for the Diffusion of Christian Spiritualism. And there she sets up a little bit of a practice. And she describes this dwelling as follows. The upper floors were occupied by the printers of the paper. And in the large back drawing room of the building, the generous Lisi had placed Miss Kate Fox, who at a salary of $1,200 a year was engaged to sit free for the public every evening. Um, this photograph, by the way, the um, spiritual photography at that time was really popular. Someone called uh, William H. Mumler had discovered ways of, of um, taking photographs where you would have a spirit figure behind you. Um, and here is Emma Harding Britton posing with uh, one of the spirits who's appearing in her photograph. Um, also, in 1874, Madame Blavatsky arrives on the scene and her initial headquarters are on 222 Madison Street, um, down in today's like, Two Bridges neighborhood. Um, and she stayed on the second floor of a tenement house there. And uh, she started uh, getting a bit of a community and spiritualism going. 
So, uh, I like to make fun of Mr. Dostix quite a lot uh, because uh, some, he, he is uh, prone to hyperbole in his narrative and he's incredibly judgmental of the tenements that he goes to visit. He himself is, uh, as, I, as I talk more about him, you'll see he's um, a middle class, very privileged uh, white male and he is not very sympathetic towards women that he goes to visit in the narrative. Um, but one thing I will say about him is that his descriptions of the Lower East Side and Williamsburg neighborhoods are amazing. They are full of beautiful, sensual descriptions of the Lower East Side, and it kind of reminds me of looking at a Jacob Rees photograph and their details. Um, here's one of the Jacob Rees photographs. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of how the other half lives and the sensation it caused in the 19th century. Um, and this is one of my favorite, um, favorite photographs um, because sometimes people would just like abandon their elderly horse in the street and they would just be left there to die. Um, and the ASPCA wasn't founded until 1866. And so this kind of demonstrates the sort of level of cruelty level towards animals back in the day. Um, and one of the reasons I use this as an illustration is because Dostix's narrative has um, a lot of hungry dogs and, and sort of thin horses uh, riding along the streets. Um, and of course, some more um, Jacob Rees images of the Lower East Side. And Dostix's narrative reminds me a lot of these dilapidated buildings that he describes and the, um, what he says is the filth of the, the streets. So, um, I, um, I'm interested in um, giving a new perspective on the fortune tellers though. Uh, so Dostix, as I mentioned, he's very harsh on the women he goes to visit. He says that they are dangerous, they are quacks, they are soothsayers. Um, but from my perspective, um, as someone who has enjoyed having her tarot cards read in the past, First of all, I really like, I, I do not believe in fortune telling, by the way. I, every, just about every reading I've been to, I've kind of been like, mm, nah, nah, nah. yeah, I'm not sure that that's quite accurate. But I love having my cards read, number one, because I love the imagery on fortune telling cards. Like, the, um, the artistry is absolutely beautiful. I was recently at an exhibition of Pamela Coleman Smith's art. Um, she did the Rider Waite Smith tarot deck um, and the exhibition's at Pratt University right now if, if anyone wants to go see it. And she, um, and, and I also love that um, as a writer I love it as a storytelling method and I really think there's um, a lot to be said about the interpretation of symbols and so forth. And looking back in the 1850s um, we didn't have cell phones, HBO back then. Like, what did you do for entertainment? So for some of these women, this was like a really fun, exciting thing to do. And it's also a kind of therapy. Like you can see like with um, some of these fortune tellers, they're really there to give some reassurance, to give advice. Um, and in a sense, they act in the role as therapists. I don't know if anyone else has enjoyed watching The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Um, but I, I love the relationship between the mother and the, the fortune teller and it's just like she just looks at her crystal ball and is like everything's going to be fine, everything's going to be fine. Let's uh, watch TV and gossip about the neighbors <laughs> and, and it really is kind of like this offering some comfort to someone else. Um, so when do Dostix find these women? Um, a lot of newspapers of the day, um, I even noticed in the Brooklyn Eagle when I was raking through it the other day that they put advertisements for fortune tellers. But most particularly around the time of 1858, this newspaper, the Spiritual Telegraph, was very popular. It was in existence from 1852 to 1860. And what kind of fascinates me about this newspaper is that its offices were on 300 Broadway. What else houses 300 Broadway? The Rudd and Carlton publisher that publishes the witches of New York. So I kind of love the idea that they were in the same place together. Dostix does not mention what kind of cards the witches were using, 
But at a good guess, uh, the Lenormand cards were very popular at the time, and they stem from um, playing decks, as you can see. But also, at one point, he does describe the symbols on the deck that one woman is using, and I found this deck here. It had a lot of the symbols that Dostix mentioned. So, now ready to talk about, take you to your first witch. The first witch I'm going to take you to, I'm going to do three of them, um, is Madame Prewster. And she is at number 373, Bowery. I'm sure as a lot of you were aware at the time, the Bowery was a place for cheap entertainment, tattoo artists, um, beer saloons, um, dime museums, all that kind of fun stuff. And Dostex occasionally does describe, you know, the sort of how outrageous this area is. Um, I will tell you, I will read a little passage from the opening of Madame Prewster. He starts out saying, this woman is one of the most dangerous of all those in the city who are engaged in the swindling trade of fortune telling and has been professionally known to the police and the public of New York for about 14 years. The amount of evil she has accomplished in that time is incalculable, for she has by no means been idle nor has she confirmed her confined her attention even to what mischief she could work by the exercise of her pretended magic. But if the authenticity of the records may be relied upon, she has bore a principal part in other illicit transactions of a more criminal nature. And of course, the implication, as always with dough sticks, is that she has been a prostitute. Um, he uh, does mention that it rained heavily the day that he goes to Madame Prewster, um, and again, his descriptions of the Lower East Side are amazing. Unearthly cars drawn by ghostly horses glided swiftly through the mist. The intangible apparitions which occupied the drivers as usual stands, hailing passengers with hollow voices and proffering with impish vigor, finger and goblin wink silent invitations to ride. Fantastic dogs sneaked out of sight round distant corners or skulked miserably under phantom carts for an imaginary shelter. Uh, her calling card, Madame Prewster's calling card, says that she um, has been relied on constantly by Napoleon. <laughs> that she has no equal. And she is going to tell the person the name of their future husband and also the name of the person visiting her. So Dostick goes to visit her. Uh, he says he's met at the door by a greasy girl, um, uh, clearly Madame Prewster's servant. And when he mentions that he's there for astrology, she tells him that it's going to cost him a dollar and a half. And he mentally notes in his head that the advertisement had said 50 cents. Uh, but it should also be noted that a lot of these women upped the charge when men were coming to visit. So it's usually something like 50 cents for women, a dollar for men. <laughs> Um, he is taken into a little reception room and there is an uncarpeted apartment of about six by eight feet with six chairs. When he looks out the window, he says the view from the window was picturesque to a degree being made up of cats, clotheslines, chimneys and crockery and occasionally when the storm lifted, a low roof nearby suggested stables. The odour which filled the air had at least the merit of being powerful. And those to whose names it was grateful could not complain that they did not get enough of it. Description must necessarily fall short of the reality, but if the reader will endeavor to imagine a couple of oil mills, a peck slip ferry boat, a candle, a soap and candle manufactory, and three or four bone boiling establishments being simmered together over a slow fire in his immediate vicinity, he may possibly arrive at a faint and distant notion of the greasy fragrance in which the abode of Madame Prewster is, um, is immersed. He ends up waiting for Madame Prewster for about an hour and a half, and he also mentions that he hears children in the background. And this is another thing that I find fascinating about this narrative. Like, this must, uh, back in a time when women did not have a lot of options for work, 
and there were definitely times when women needed to have work. You know, um, there was actually an epidemic of uh, missing husbands around the mid-19th century to even the beginning of the 20th century, and women were forced to make a living for themselves. And reading between the lines, here's a great way for women to make money that doesn't involve doing laundry or cooking or domestic work, but also allows them to be in the home and be able to look after their children. So a lot of times when Dostix goes to visit these women, he often hears or sees children in the background. And I always thought, wow, this must have been a great way for women to make a living and also not to have to pay for childcare. Um, the other thing that's kind of fascinating to me about Madame Prouster is we have this great beginning where he describes her as being dangerous, criminal, and so forth. And, I, and every time I read one of these, the beginning, opening of these chapters, like, oh, I can't wait to read this woman. And she would always end up being like this sort of middle-aged woman, just, you know, with arthritics, who was just like fairly docile. <laughs> like, nothing dangerous <laughs> about this person at all. <laughs> Um, when he first meets her, he says that she could be any age from 45 to 120. <laughs> and that her face is so oily, wrinkles won't stay on it. Yeah. Uh, grim, grizzled, and stony eyed is this juicy old sibyl, he says. And he says that Madame Prouster seems to have gotten out, just gotten out of bed, even though it is just past noon, and that she yawns a lot. Um, I suspect she has other work to keep her occupied, and that's why she's probably a fair bit tired. So she tells him that she is going to guess the name of his first wife, and she says that his first wife will have four letters in her name. She's actually correct on that score, <laughs> because now that I know this guy's biography, um, his first wife's name was Anna. And Madame Prouster begins to go through a series of women, uh, four-letter women's names uh, with a question mark at the end of every one, like Emma, Anna, <laughs> Ella, Jane. And then she finally lands on Mary and says, that, that must be it, that must be it. And then she says she's going to reveal the name of the reporter. He tells her his name begins with M, and it's got eight letters in it. I do know Mr. Dostix's real name. It was Mortima. Um, and Mortima was a pretty common name back then, but Madame Prouster goes through a series of eight-letter M names and does not land on Mortima for some reason. Um, she then tells him to cut the cards and says he'll get three wishes and says that he'll have one wife and four children. I know from his biography he had two wives and two children. Um, at the end of the reading she starts to, uh, he says, wriggle uneasily and he respects her rheumatics so he took his leave. Um, I was very interested in following the um, before and aftermath of a lot of these women, um, which can be a little bit difficult, especially for working class women, but I decided to go through uh, the city directories for six of these different fortune tellers to see what happened, how they were listing themselves in 1856 versus 1860 after the book had come out. And what I found really fascinating about Madame Prister is that she listed herself as a physician in 1856. Uh, some of the fortune tellers claimed that they had powers to cure people's illnesses. So that's possibly why she listed herself as a physician. But at another point in the book, he goes to see someone called Mrs. Hayes, who also claims to have these psychic powers that can heal his illnesses. And interestingly, he likens her to Madame Restelle, um, another woman who's accused of being, um, of having witchy powers. Um, has anyone heard of Madame Restelle? Some nods. Yeah, she, she was an abortionist in the 1800s. Um, she occasionally, she was accused of being the wickedest woman in New York. Um, and she actually spent a year in Blackwell's penitentiary um, because she performed an abortion that went horribly wrong and she was caught out. When she got out of uh, the penitentiary, she decided that from then on she was only going to give pills. 
and she is also going to keep a directory of all the names of the powerful men who came to see her about taking care of their mistresses, and by that way she managed to keep herself out of jail for quite oh, some time. Um, so, on to our next witch, um, Madame Morrow, and this is my favorite. And I also meant to mention one of the wonderful ironies of this book is that, um, and he does list all the addresses, a lot of the witches are located on Broom Street. <laughs> we all know that's Broom spelled with an E, but it's kind of a wonderful irony about the whole thing. Um, and I love Madame Morrow because Madame Morrow will only accept women visitors. Now he implies it's because women are more gullible. I'm starting to think maybe it's because women were safer. You know, um, these fortune tellers would tell fortune in like a single room all by themselves with no security. So maybe um, for them, they felt like women were a safer customer. Um, but uh, Dostix is determined to go and visit Madame Morrow. So he decides that he's going to have to get dressed up as a woman. <laughs> and Dostix, um, in real life, had had um, a bit of a stint as a theatre actor. So he calls up all his theatrical friends and has this um, Mrs. Doubtfire moment. <laughs> and he says that, uh, where is the quote, I love this so much, um, that his friends cover him with layer upon layer of complicated mysteries of laces, ribbons, strings, bones, buttons, pins, capes, collars, and other inexplicable articles. Oh and after they've spent all this time dressing him up, they suddenly realize they've forgotten to shave off his mustache. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they, they shave off his mustache, and when he looks in his mirror, he thought that he saw his own landlady. <laughs> Uh, when he goes to visit Madame Morrow, he describes her place as being a low three-story brick house, which cannot be called dirty simply because that mild word expresses an approximation to cleanliness, which no house in this locality has known for years. <laughs> in the twilight or darkness, he would be robbed if not garroted and murdered. <laughs> um, he said that the room is small, shabby, and dirty, and that the principal furniture is a basket full of soiled linen. Um, I'm wondering if Madame Morrow might also have been a laundress in, in, um, in her other um, occupation. So he sits in a room, waits for Madame Morrow, um, and eventually he's taken up another flight of stairs, which he, of course he describes as dirty. Two, four feet, two, two favorite words in this narrative are, are dirt and filth. Um, and he's taken to see her in a closet-like room. Um, he describes her as a tall, sallow-looking woman with a complexion the color of old parchments, with light brown eyes and light hair. Uh, being attired in a handsome Delaine dress of half mourning, so maybe she's a widow, and decorated with a costly cameo pen and eardrops, she looked not unlike a servant out for a holiday, making a sensation in her mistress's finery. <laughs> yeah, he's nasty. <laughs> So she asks him for the month in which he was born. She looks it up in one of her astrological books. Um, she tells him that he is amiable, questionable, um, frank, and a very desirable partner. Um, she tells him that his lucky days are Tuesday and Thursday, and that he's going to have luck and prosperity, and a surprise will come to him in two hours, maybe two days, maybe two weeks, maybe two months. <laughs> And then she gives him uh, one of those magic mirrors, and it, he says that it's a kind of telescope-like object. And she tells him, and of course he's dressed as a woman at this point, she tells him that if he looks through this telescope-like object, he will see the husband of his future. So Dostix looks through the telescope and he says he sees a man with a mustache, black eyes, black hair, and a hangdog thief face. Um, and when he described this man, I know from seeing this uh, uh, Dostix's picture that it actually just described himself. <laughs> um, he leaves Madame Morrow, but interestingly, I was looking up articles in the Herald Tribune by Dostix, 
And on October 21st, 1858, just two months before the Dostix book comes out, he had penned an article about Madame Morrow saying that she had been arrested for fortune telling. And uh, she, at that point, she was at number 46 Northwick Street. She had, um, was no longer practicing in Broom Street. And what's also interesting about this article is that he says um, his forthcoming book, which is of New York, will be looked upon for increased interest because of this first attempt to break up the illegal business. So um, according to him, this is one of the first times someone has been arrested for fortune telling. So now I'm going to head over to Spring Street. Um, I want to go uh, to this place because the next person who practices Mrs. Seymour at 110 Spring Street, um, she is a spiritualist and she claims to be able to connect with the dead. Uh, where are you? Ah, here she is. So her house is between Mercer and Green. And he said the house um, number 10 on 110 Spring Street, occupied by Mrs. Seymour for business purposes, is not more seedy in appearance than the majority of halfway decent tenant houses, which all have a decrepit look after they are four or five years old. It had the look of better days departed. It is a house where a man on a small salary would apply for cheap board. Um, so, uh, Dostix goes to visit her, and as with most uh, seances of the day, they had to hold hands. And Dostix says the worst of it was that Mrs. Seymour's hand is not agreeable one to hold. It is cold and flabby and not suggestive of vitality. Her face, too, had become pallid and corpse-like, and her thin blue lips were not pleasant to regard. So Mrs. Seymour, um, once she's in her trance, she asks Dostix where he wants to go. And Dostix says he wants to um, find some people who have passed in Minnesota. And Dostix, um, uh, in his, when I reveal his real life biography, he um, actually did spend some time in Minnesota. Uh, Mrs. Seymour says she tells him that she sees two very old people, one a man and a woman who are sick with fever. And she continues to give like, some very vague details on these two people, and Dostick says that she delivers it in a jerky manner, with occasional twitchings of the face and violent claspings of the hands. And he says that when he asks her for more details on these people, um, she, Mrs. Seymour, refuses to give him actual details of the people that he is talking about. So there's a final awkward moment where he doesn't know how to end the seance. He just like pauses and kind of waits, and then Mrs. Seymour's eyes flash open. Uh, her Irish servant comes back and like rubs her temples, and then she is out of the trance. Uh, Dostick gives her a dollar, and then he leaves. Uh, these are only a few of the women that he goes to visit. There's about 25 women that he goes to visit in this narrative. Uh, at the end of his book, he concludes the following. A recapitulation of the various prophecies made to the cash customer would show that he has been promised 33 wives and something over 90 children. <laughs> he was brought into the world on various occasions between 1820 and 1833 that he was born under nearly all the planets known to astronomers, <laughs> that he has more birthplaces than he has fingers and toes, that he has passed through so many scenes of unexpected happiness and complicated misfortune in his past life, all that he must have lived 50 hours to the day and been wide awake all the time. And he has so many future fortunes marked out for him that at 350 years old, his work will not be half done. And when at last all is finally accomplished, a minute dissection of his aged corpus will be necessary, that his earthly remains may be buried in all the places set down for him by these prophets. So I'm now ready to talk about who Q.K. Philander Dostix really is. He is Mortimer Thompson. Uh, born in 1832 in Riga, New York, in a little town that's uh, not too far from Rochester. And Mortimer Thompson had a skeleton or two in his closet. 
because according to his New York Times obituary, he was expelled from the University of Michigan for, and I quote, too much enterprise in securing subjects for the dissection room. Oh. Yeah, he was a grave robber. He also had a stint as an actor with an itinerant theater company. And then he settled into New York to um, what he said was meet with the celebrities at the time. But then uh, he wrote this article called Dough Sticks in a Bender, which is kind of this fun, tongue-in-cheek, sort of frat boy writing about his escapades in Niagara Falls. And it was a huge hit, quite a sensation. And he ended up writing a series of articles for the um, Herald Tribune. And he ended up writing a book for, which was published by Rudd and Carlton called Dough Sticks, What He Says. And he became an overnight literary sensation. The readers just ate it up. Uh, shortly after visiting the uh, witches in the tenements, he ended up getting smallpox. Um, and he was sick for a couple of weeks, but he managed to get over that. And then he married a 16-year-old woman called Anna Van Cleve. Um, just four days after the publication of The Witches of New York, Anna Van Cleve died in childbirth. Um, so he was only 27 years old um, and a widower. But then, just a few years later, in 1861, he ended up marrying a woman called Grace Eldridge. And some of this story shows like what a prominent figure he had become in New York society, because according to the New York Times, the man who married him off was this man. I hear from some of the murmurs who know who Henry Ward Beecher is. He is, of course, a famous preacher, so famous in Brooklyn that there were Beecher boats that came from Manhattan um, to Brooklyn. To, um, people came to hear him preach every Sunday. Um, and he was also a famous abolitionist. He would do these mock slave auctions in his church to raise money to free slaves. Um, but he, um, his downfall was the ladies. And of course, uh, uh, he ended up um, kind of being brought down by uh, another uh, witch, uh, Victoria Woodhall. Um, let's see, um, the other thing that's kind of fascinating about this wedding is that it took place in the, the home of a man called James Parton, a squire. He was also a famous biographer of the day. Some of his biographies included Horace Greeley, Abraham Lincoln, um, uh, Voltaire, Aaron Burr, Andrew Jackson, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson. So he was the biographer of the day. And then the year after their marriage, Grace also died in childbirth. And she gave birth to a daughter called Ethel, who survived. Ethel ended up being raised by James Parton and his wife, and even though she was never legally adopted by them, she ended up taking on their name. And she became a literary figure herself. In the 1920s and 30s, she was a published children's book author, and she wrote about um, the history of Newburyport, Massachusetts. And she actually wrote and went on to write a, very, um, a series of popular children's books. Uh, Mortimer Thompson was also a frequenter of Fafs. Uh, Fafs was a kind of bohemian drinking establishment. It was known for its literary and artistic clientele. It opened in 1855. Um, and before uh, 1862, the address was 647 Broadway, which is kind of between today's Bleecker and 3rd Street. It's now a deli. Um, but um, if you look at this photograph, this man here is Walt Whitman, another frequenter of Fafs. And it's also uh, known as one of those places, you know, that was very, um, because it was so bohemian, it was also very sexually permissive, if you know what I mean. And that's where Walt Whitman would sometimes go to meet uh, other men. Um, according to the New York Times obituary on Mortimer Thompson, and he was an abolitionist, 
Uh, during the riots of July 1863, I think some of you are familiar with the uh, draft riots of 1863, uh, Mr. Thompson performed an act of bravery and manliness that did him much honor. Looking from his window in 17th Street, he saw a poor old color woman flying from a crowd of Irish rioters. Rushing into the room of the writer of this notice, he seized a navy revolver and without waiting for hat or coat, hurried into the street, took the old woman's arm in his, and pointing the cocked pistol at her persecutors, kept them at bay until he had her safely in the station house three blocks away. Mortimer Thompson passed away in 1875. I am still trying to find out what he passed away from. Um, I'm probably about to find out because a friend of mine in uh, Greenwood Cemetery is going to look in another book next week and, and, and reveal all for me. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm super curious because a lot of the obituaries hint at excessive opium use, which is pretty common back then actually. Um, one of the obituaries says his unfortunate habits including a use of opium clouded his later years. Um, my good friend Sarah Durkis sent me these documents from Greenwood Cemetery, um, and she said that he purchased his lot in 1860 uh, for his two children and his two wives. Um, and after I heard he was buried in Greenwood Cemetery, of course I had to go out hiking there. I went there Saturday after it had been snowing, and I managed to find this his uh, grave in the in the snow, and he is not too. If, if anyone here is familiar with Greenwood Cemetery, he's not too far from Charlotte Kanda's mausoleum. Uh, she is the teenager who accidentally designed her own very ornamental mausoleum. Um, all right, so um, he. Uh, it seems that Mortimer Thompson still has an influence. Um, so interestingly, um, so a lot of you have probably heard that Harry Houdini was a famous exposer of spiritualists and psychics. He lost his mother and he was devastated by the whole thing. So he started going to see spiritualists and psychics. And because he, was, uh, he had a background as an illusionist and a magician, he started to notice the ways in which they would play tricks on him. And he thought this was a horrible thing to do to other people, um, to lie to them about being able to contact their loved ones. So he decided to make it his job to expose uh, some of these psychics and spiritualists. Mm -hmm. And he, in 1926, he ended up writing a book called Miracle Mongers and Their Methods, a complete expose in which he went around to various psychics and, and just showed how they, and how they were doing these tricks. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, Susan Fair, the person I mentioned at the beginning, the author of American Witches, said she visited Harry Houdini's library. And in that library was a battered first edition of Witches of New York by Q.K. Philander mm -hmm. Dostics. So, um, and she also noted the book plate of Harry Houdini's in one of the Dostick's books. Uh, so it seems like he did have an influence on other people in later life. Um, to this day, writers still write these exposés of various psychics. Um, I came across an article by David Morrow in the New York Times from 1996. 2000, uh, September 2014, an article in Gotham, what, what I learned from five Manhattan palm readers. Um, 2013, Sylvia Mitchell of the Zena Clairvoyant Shop on 7th Avenue South was arrested for um, conning $128,000 out of people to get rid of bad spirits. Um, and you might also be interested to know that fortune telling in New York is a class B misdemeanor. Except there is this one little uh, caveat in all of that. Um, I'll read the, the actual uh, penal code for this, except that this section does not apply to a person who engages in the aforescribed conduct as part of a show or exhibition solely for the purpose of entertainment or amusement. So if you announce that you're doing fortune telling for entertainment, it's all fine. 
With that said, I would just like to say that this, this lecture is for entertainment purposes. <laughs> um, finally, just a couple of promos. I am the author of a novel called Holly's Hurricane, but there is a lot of history in it. Um, I'm also doing tours with Burrs of the Dead, and I'm actually doing a Witches of Old New York tour on March 30th at 3 o'clock. It is going to cover uh, different characters from what we've done, what we've talked about in this lecture, and it's also going to talk about some of the um, men psychics of the day, and some of them just have the kookiest personalities. I love talking about them. Um, and we're actually doing a kind of Women's History Month thing. We'll be doing Spiritualists of Greenwood Cemetery and uh, uh, Female Ghosts of Greenwich Village. So um, I hope you can join us for some of that. Um, I guess we have time for questions if anyone wants to ask. 